This is Fans on the Run, a podcast made by, for, and about Beatles fans. And now, here's your host, Ethan Alexander. Hello, 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 hello. Welcome back to Fans on the Run, the most profound Beatles podcast. And I, I, I say that with 100% certainty. Again, if there's one thing you can take away from this show, it's I think this would be the thing written on my tombstone. Don't quote me on that. You you can't quote me on anything with this show, which as I as I work my way to try and become a credible source, I realize that may be counterintuitive telling people not to take my word for things. But you know what? This is my fucking show. Oops, I swore. Oh well. I okay that that intro was completely disjointed. One of my words. Just go today, with it, man. Just go with it. Again, and but the thing is, I'm not editing that out. That's that, fine. That's, that's the intro. There is there is nothing else. So anyway. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so I, I I occasionally pull out this uh, little shtick from my bag of tricks. Mystery guest, how are you today? I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? I am alive that's good that's good to be alive yes it, i'm alive too it's a good feeling yeah it, it'd be kind of weird if, if i wasn't alive i mean we could pull a paul mccartney and say that we're dead uh, yes because as we've proven on this show time and time again paul is dead totally yes funny thing <laughs> fun and you know what ringo killed him no oh, no one now? no one knows this i uh, i'm the only one who knows this Wow, no, see, no you, one see me. you taught me something. I've been teaching people about the Beatles for a long time, and you taught me something today, sir. Well, please don't call me sir. Ah. I don't deserve <laughs> it. Anyways, uh, we are joined by a fantastic guest. You can see her on YouTube. You can see her on Instagram. You can see her on TikTok. And she's actually hosting a uh She's a fellow podcaster. She hosts a Back to the Future podcast called What the Flux, which I fucking love the title of that. Thank you so much. Caitlin Larkin, <laughs> welcome to Fans on the Run. Oh, Ethan, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here talking with you. Oh, well, that that, that always makes me happy when I hear uh, guests are excited because I know I get to immediately disappoint them. But the thing is, see, you as you said, I'm a fellow podcaster and I'm never usually the one who's being interviewed. I'm always the, the interviewee. So I'm super, super excited to do this. And of course, the Beatles are my favorite thing to talk about in the entire world. So I am more here so for than this. back to the future. Yes, more oh. so than back to the future by a long shot, which a lot of people are like, Caitlin, I can't believe you don't have a Beatles podcast. And it's like, look. My life is already surrounded by the Beatles, and I just, I, I kind of feel like you. I feel like, oh my God, I, I, you know, I'd be a disappointment if I had a Beatles podcast. Are you, are you <laughs> saying I'm a disappointment? No, I'm just saying the way you feel about it is probably yeah. how I would feel about it as well. Uh, I, I keep thinking to myself, like, man, the Beatles podcast market's really oversaturated. And then I realized, no, Ethan, it you're, really con is. you're contributing to that. <laughs> You you are the oversaturated. <laughs> there are so many though. Yeah, and no, of, but of course but mine really is are better. A ton. Mine is better than all of them. That you Absolutely. can quote me on. Done. And as you, someone who has probably seen over one episode of Fans on the Run, can attest <laughs> to that. I can. I have in fact listened to one entire episode of Fans on the Run. I'm sorry, that's the worst. I'm terrible. Oh no, it's fine. Uh, out of curiosity, tell the audience which episode you listened to. I listened to the episode with my good friend Jackie Spencer because she's amazing and I had to listen to it right away. We we love Jackie, don't we? Yes, we do. I love her with all my heart. It's I feel like I I I, I interviewed her, but I haven't taken one of her tours yet because I I only got in contact with her after this whole, you know, lockdown quarantine corona shebang. Right. Same with Richard Porter. So now next time I go to, go to England, I have all these people that I, I have to go take tours from. Yeah, um, it was amazing. I went to Liverpool last October and I went to London as well. Actually, I spent four days in London first and four days in Liverpool. And I took one giant tour with Richard and I took one with Jackie and it was the greatest experience. 
funny th- funny enough actually this might be an interesting segue to talk about like how the beatles have uh, impacted your life you said uh, you were in uh, london last october yes now here here's the coincidence i was in your neck of the woods orlando That's right. at the same time and uh for those of you who don't know if you don't follow uh caitlin she uh she does some stuff at the uh hard rock cafe at uh, universal and they have this really cool sh- secret beatles tour Shh, it's a secret and i i went there <laughs> basically with the sole intention because i hadn't been to a hard rock cafe in a few years I'm like well i i have to take this tour it's like, and I was so excited. And then I got there and it's like, oh, we're not doing that today. I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah, yeah, the girl who does it, she's not here. I'm like, Caitlin? And they're like, yeah, she's in England. Like, yeah, my bad, bro. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So the most I got to see was like one of the suits in a room. Yeah, that's a shame. No, uh, I've been the vibe host over at Hard Rock Orlando since uh, 2012. And that particular cafe has the largest collection of Beatles memorabilia out of any Hard Rock cafe that you go to. Of course, there are over 200 cafes in over 70 countries. And Do you have uh, that or- written out in front of you? No, I've been doing these tours for eight years. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny because of the pandemic and everything, of course, unfortunately, um, we're not doing tours anymore. But it doesn't matter. You do something so much for so many years. I mean, I average about five to six tours a day when I was doing it five days a week for so many years. It just stays with you forever. So, I mean, it was quite a sight to behold. Uh, in, in Orlando, even though a lot of it was in the secret tour, which I couldn't get yes. to. You were very close, though. If you were in the room that had Paul McCartney's suit, you it was just on the other side of that wall. It, it was <laughs> their, like, beetle room, which had, yeah, so, like, uh, like, bricks from the cavern, I think. What, yeah. The door, was it the door from Apple? No, so back in the day, before I even worked at Hard Rock, the doors that used to go into the Roots of Rock room were the doors from Abbey Road Studios, oh, those white Road. doors. Now, those got lost to New York City in some sort of a bet. I forget the actual story. Fuckers. Yeah, but we lost the doors to New York City Hard Rock, and so they have them there. Um, so now it's just plain, regular wooden doors. Uh, but the bricks that they have there, it's a shame because the plaque on there says Cavern Club Bricks, but they're not actually from the Cavern Club. If you look at the rest of the plaque, the first um, sentence says that these are bricks, you know, adjacent to the Cavern from Matthew (laughs) Street. And it's like, man, Hard Rock, why are you trying to lie to people? See, I always pride myself that I'm the tour guide that told the truth. I had a bunch of other coworkers that I used to work with that would lie just to please the guests and try and make tips and all that stuff. But no, I wanted to always be truthful with my guests because they could just, you know, go on Google, look it up and see that so-and-so is a liar. Uh, but also my favorite is when I've had repeat guests from people who had taken tours before I started working there and they'll say something about a piece and I'm like, uh, it's not true. (laughs) I was always breaking people's hearts, but I would say, you know, I'd rather give you the correct information, you know, because what's the point? Well, since, since I wasn't able to actually take the tour, um, what, what are some of the, some of the highlights that I would see behind the, those locked doors oh man okay we oh we got so much stuff back there uh probably G- give me a few my, highlights sure no worries no uh probably some of my favorite items so you walk through one of these doors and it takes you into the vip beatles hallway which is just all beatles all throughout the way and it's where the private restrooms for the celebrities are mm-hmm. and so there's actually a BOAC air flight menu from 64 okay. signed by the boys. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's probably one of the coolest things. And everybody goes, oh, my God, is that, you know, from when they flew to America for Ed Sullivan? And I'm like, nah, uh They flew on Pan Am. Yeah. 
on that trip, not BOAC. So I assume it's from a flight from the first U.S. tour in the fall of 64. That's what I get from just kind of piecing things together. Yeah, just using, um, like, context clues. Exactly, and nobody else uses those. Uh, <laughs> so it's exactly another thing that I totally prided myself uh, when giving those tours. Um we have an original Quarrymen business card that McCartney had printed up back in 58. Oh, I, I have, there, there's a book that has all this, these like replica knickknack things. Yeah. And yeah. There, I have that book yeah, too. And there's a, I think a Quarrymen business card in there, but you yeah. have like one of the real ones. Uh, we have one of the real ones from 58. Oh, can I have it? Uh, it, Hey, if you got a screwdriver and no one's looking, I won't tell. <laughs> That's staying um, in. So we have a lot of pieces of John Lennon original artwork as well. Okay. And there's one of the pieces from the Amsterdam bed in also in the hallway, oh, wow. which is really neat. Uh, it's one of the little self portrait doodles of John and Yoko. And it says peace and love at the top. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it's really cool. And so you get down to the end of the Beatles hallway. And of course is the door to the VIP room. And so you open the door and like I said, it's a secret. You open Shh. it. Yeah, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. You open the door, and of course, the secret room is the John Lennon room. And so it's completely white walls, white carpet, white furniture, just the way John would have wanted it. People are like, oh my God, is this supposed to be a replica of his apartment? And I'm like, no, that's one of the many big misconceptions about the tour. It's just supposed to look like the room that the Imagine music video was yeah, done in. just white. Exactly. It's just supposed to give it, up if that If my memory vibe. serves me correctly from uh, videos of this, there, there's a big piano, but there's there something is. special about the keys. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, all 52 white keys are signed by some of the greatest piano players ever. And it was a really cool charity piece done with an Orlando charity called Give Kids the World. So Hard Rock... Uh, got the piano from them during an auction and so what Give Kids the World had done was take off the keys and sent them out to all of these piano players it was then signed and put back on and then Hard Rock bought it at auction and everybody goes oh my god is it John Lennon's piano I'm like no it's not John's piano but it's still really incredible <laughs> yeah um and la last thing with that room which I think is the coolest thing that I remember yes. uh John's, uh, would you call it a couch or would it be a chair? So the proper name for it, it's actually a French settee. Okay. And it's from Kenwood. Yes, it's from his Kenwood estate that used to be in the sunroom. So Lennon had that, I want to say, from around like 66 to 69 when he and Yoko eventually moved out. But it's absolutely the number one coolest piece if I could steal anything from Hard Rock Orlando, that would have been it <laughs> right there. That's like my baby. So anytime I would go in to do my walkthrough at work, I would go into the Lennon room and give the couch a little hug to start my day. And I always go, hi, John. Well, it, it wasn't Orlando, but one of the coolest uh, sites of Beatle memorabilia that I've ever seen was uh at a hard rock and it was it was the new york one and I, I don't know if they still have this display but when i was there uh like right as you walk in they have uh, a set of the four colorless suits yeah they still do yeah. it's and still it was there. one of the most mind-blowing things because you know if you go to other hard rocks you can see like bits and pieces of other suits other museums but that was a full set of matching suits yeah, no, it's an, it's incredible. I love that display. As soon as you go down the escalator into the restaurant, it's uh, pretty remarkable. And another really cool thing about the Times Square Hard Rock is that it used to be the old Paramount Theater. And, of course, the Beatles performed there in 1964. Oh, there so you go. So that makes it even more amazing. Um, One thing I will say, because I, I, I remember this... Um. Hard Rock is the owner, because I, I go down these rabbit holes. Um, Hard Rock had a theme park at one yes. point somewhere. And Myrtle at, Beach, South Carolina. There, there you go. Employee of the month. 
I should have been. I never was. Bastards. Yeah. Oops. Fuckers. <laughs> uh, well, um... They own the Magical Mystery Tour bus. Yes. Now, actually, that's a funny story, too, because... Okay, wait, there's more. Please tell me. Oh, there is more. So, Hard Rock, I don't know what year they got the Magical Mystery Tour bus, but they had it for years. And for a long time, before they moved it to Myrtle Beach, it used to be outside of Hard Rock Orlando. Oh, wow. And so, what they did, and now this is the legit original bus... Uh, They redid the inside because, you know, it was kind of nasty. But what they did is they would sell T-shirts out of the bus in front of the cafe. No, it's awesome. It was cool. Like, they would just open the windows and sell T-shirts right out of the bus. Um, But I went, I want to say this was around 2002. So I wasn't even living in Florida at the time. I was still living... Uh, in New York and my brother and I were just on a family vacation you know with my mom and my aunt and we saw the Magical Mystery Tour bus and if I would have told baby Caitlin that you know 10 years later I'd be working there I would have pooped my pants (laughs) but the bus wasn't there no the bus was there in 2002 no I mean in when you work there no right Right, in 2012, where, it was already gone. where the fuck this bus is? I know that it's in Florida. That's all I know. It is in a warehouse, which is a damn shame, in Florida. Now, the thing is, the corporate office for Hard Rock used to be here in Orlando. And just until about two years ago, they moved down south to Hollywood, Florida, where the big guitar-shaped hotel is now. Okay. Is that the one that has the statues of the Beatles, like, in the help poses? No. Okay. Yeah, it's just a, it's a guitar-shaped hard rock hotel down in Hollywood, Florida, next to the hard rock stadium where the Miami Dolphins uh, play football. Okay. Um, so the corporate office moved everything over there. So I honestly have no clue if the garage that holds the celebrity cars is still here in Orlando or if it got moved down to South Florida because they moved all the regular memorabilia. That's just a damn shame. It really is. But yes, Hard Rock still owns the bus. It's in their possession. It's in the state of Florida, but I have no clue where. Like at, at that point, just, you know, if you're not displaying it, send it up to Cleveland to the Rock Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And, well, and just put it. We're on not the... buddies. We're not buddies with the Rock Hall. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, when the Rock Hall opened back in the '80s, they basically didn't have any memorabilia, so they took a lot of it from Hard Rock because we had a partnership at the time. But from what I heard, there was some there was some beef there. So I'm not really sure exactly what the details are, but I know that we're not too friendly with the folks at the Rock Hall. I, I just mean theoretically. A, a yes, place theoretically. where someone could see the bus. Because it, yeah. it's, the, it's the goddamn magical mystery tour bus. Absolutely. Anyways, enough about me rambling about old coach buses from the 60s that some <laughs> fucking four acid junkies rode around in and made a terrible movie. Um Actually, before I start asking my normal questions, you are a record collector, right? I am. I am. I, I have been to Orlando a number of times, but I'm, I'm sad to say I've only been to one Orlando record shop. Could you could you tell us about the uh, record collecting scene in Orlando? Oh, man, it's insane over here in Orlando. And the weird thing is, like, there are so many record shops over in East Orlando and even I've been here almost nine years. I haven't been to them all. Because I'll be like, oh my god, there's a record store over there? Weird. Okay. <laughs> it's just so random. I think I have only been to about four or five. And I think there's like at least five more. Okay. That I haven't stumbled upon. Wh- which is your main store? So my main store is one, it's uh, closer to Winter Park, Florida. It's called Park Ave CDs. Okay. And I also love 
Rock and Roll Heaven, which I, is about... I love Rock and Roll Heaven. It, it, it's literally a five-minute drive away from Rock and Roll Heaven. A lot of the record stores, they're all in the same downtown Orlando district. Damn and it. it's funny because I live... I don't live out far west like by Disney. I literally live around the corner from Universal Studios. Mm. So I'm definitely... I'm more I'm farther west than all the record stores, but not as far as Disney. Oh, that, and so that's it, one thing I, I kind of liked about downtown Orlando. Yeah. It's like when you're in kind of where I was staying, because, you know, tourist Disney, uh, it, it starts to feel a little like the Truman Show. Sure. Where everything is owned by the mouse. Yep. Yeah. Like, you know, suddenly, like the only thing to do is, you know, Disney. Hey, that's how they get your money. Well, it yeah, works. but then yep. you know, one of my, I'll I'll say one memory before we go back to that. Uh, we were at the what 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 the hell's the uh, well you're from Orlando the the Disney Resort where John Lennon broke up the Beatles. The Polynesian Resort, that's, which that's is also fun fact, it's also where I got married. Really, really, I had to get married where John broke up the Beatles. Oh man. <laughs> That, that's that's either really good or really bad mojo. No, I think it's incredible mojo. Yeah, like where something ends, another thing begins. Exactly, there yeah. you go. But I, I found myself uh, there one night watching the fireworks uh, because we didn't want to pay for park tickets or something. Uh, and so we were eating those uh, Dole Whips. Yes, Dole Whip. And my mom's like, I love this view. And I'm like... Yes, I too love sitting on an artificial beach, on an artificial lake, on a property founded by a man uh, who f basically froze himself to outlive the Jews. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no comment there as a Jew. Oh, yeah. Well, it, <laughs> Walt Disney, you know, wasn't exact. I'm, I'm not going to say he was an anti-Semite, um, but he was an anti-Semite. Oh, geez. All right. We're not going to get into this one. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's for another podcast. That's definitely for another show. Okay. Anyways, what what's so special about Park Avenue CDs? Um, I just like the vibe of that store. Um, I think it's very organized, whereas Rock and Roll Heaven, like, it, things are kind of everywhere and you kind of have to go digging. I like that everything is so well put together at Park Ave. And also... Their used records are very, very fairly priced. Like, if they get, you know, a decent Beatle record in, which is very rare, um, you know, it'll never be more than, like, $30, where if you go to Rock and Roll Heaven, you have to price gouge, you know, from, like, 100 bucks, you know, yeah. to try and get it to go down. Uh, but I get most of my, like, solo Beatles records from there in their used selection and i never pay more than ten dollars well and it's always in immaculate condition well that yeah uh, nor should you pay more than ten dollars for most of right it. but you know how some record stores are it's like oh just because yeah. it's a beetle i can raise the price and some yes. you know poor schmuck is gonna pay for it ringo star stop and smell the roses he was a beetle thirty dollars exactly exactly and now we will begin with the normal questions. <laughs> All right. No no more talk about Walt Disney. Okay. <laughs> Caitlin? Yes. When did you first discover the Beatles? As long as I can remember, the Beatles have always been in my life. I don't remember a point in time where I didn't know who they were. Well, when when did you become when was your genesis as a fan? 2 years old. Could you describe that for us? So at two years old, I, my first memories are being home with my dad because I have an older brother, and so he was off already in school, and my mom was the one who went to work. So it was just my father and I during those really, you know, important toddler years. Mm -hmm. And my dad being also a record collector, a music junkie, pop culture type person, um, instead of, you know, putting on the regular kitty shows for me would put on MTV and Beatle movies. Okay, so <laughs> you, you were instead of like raised on, you know, 
I'm, I'm trying to think. Well, Muppet Babies, you would have been raised well, on no, help. I, I mean, I, I did watch Muppet Babies. Don't get me wrong. Muppet Babies are my shit. Um, but, like, so I had a collection of the typical VHSs that one has when you're a kid. You know, all the Disney typical stuff. And then we had that one copy of Yellow Submarine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And my dad would always pick me up first thing in the morning after I had my breakfast and go, okay, Katie, what do you want to watch today? And I always pointed at Yellow Submarine. Every single time I had to start the day with that movie. Every single time. Every single time. There wasn't a day (laughs) from the time I was two to four where I did not watch Yellow Submarine. There is no quiet, only Yellow Submarine. (laughs) Exactly. So, um, it being raised on Yellow Submarine, I, I can only imagine that shapes you as a person in, in in a way. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, the thing that got me interested was that, you know, okay, here are the Beatles. And on any long car rides, too, my parents always would put Beatle cassettes in, you know, the tape deck in the car. So now, it was now just... explain to the... Explain to the folks at home what a cassette is. Oh, Jesus, I, I'm, don't I'm do sure, that to me, Ethan. I, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, Zoomers listening to e- Ethan, I'm only 31. Don't make me feel that old, man. <laughs> Caitlin, I have a collection of eight tracks. You, you, you know, we're, we're on the same page here. See, I know we're on the same page, but that doesn't mean there's not a listener out there that might not know, and that scares me. <laughs> Oh, oh, trust me. I, I don't think I have a viewer younger than 40. <laughs> I have the same problem. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no, we'll get into that later. Oh, yeah. Um, No, but so anytime long car rides, Beatles music was always playing. So when you finally start to associate the two, I wanted to learn more. So my dad would go, okay, well, if you like this... Then here's A Hard Day's Night. Here's Help. Here's Magical Mystery Tour. Okay, he, well, he made a mistake there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's only human. Yeah. That um, that movie traumatized me, and I watched it for the first time when I was 11. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I got so excited, you know, because I had seen the movie on store shelves for years. This, like, weird... I'm sure you, as, like, a, a Beatle collector, like, in the... 2000s uh remember the dvd of yellow or of magical mystery tour in print sure do. was yep. this like weird bootleg avenue one well it, it looked very similar to the old vhs copy yeah yeah for sure um i actually picked one up not too long ago just as a novelty looks nice. like shit but uh, but i remember i had gotten home because they had finally just reissued it like crystal clear hd i bought the dvd i went home i'm gonna watch i'm gonna watch magical mystery tour and i i was a little confused um but then it got to the point with with uh, the restaurant scene where uh john was shoveling spaghetti that's my favorite part oh you fucking sociopath i no, shut it's because I, I shut it off and ran to the bathroom <laughs> That's my favorite part because my favorite food is pasta and I just wish I was that lady and swimming in a bowl of pasta that size. Yeah, but it didn't even look like pasta. It looked like, you know, throw up. Nah, no, that looks like some good spaghetti goodness and I want it. Okay. Oh, wow. (laughs) See, kids, this is what happens when you're raised on yellow submarine. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Oh, I, I still can't watch that movie. And it, it's hard because I, I, you know, just got the, the Blu-ray because now um, I'm, you know, upgrading all my DVDs to the Blu-rays, even though that's kind of stupid because physical media is like dying. Right. Um, and, you know, it's like, oh, here's the restaurant scene. That was a good movie. I'll turn it off now. <laughs> yeah. Ma- good old Magical Mystery Tour. Oh. Anyways, where were we before I... Anyways, be- Beatles movies. Yeah, before so, I had my uh, 
uh, Vietnam flashbacks. <laughs> so I, I basically started my fandom, which is so weird because most people are like, oh, Beatle albums, Beatle albums, Beatle albums. But I became a fan of the Beatles through the movies. And because I wanted to learn more about them, any old VHS that my dad have, he would basically play for me no matter what. So whether, you know, before the Beatles anthology, we had The Complete Beatles. Have uh, you yeah. seen that documentary? The Complete with uh, yes. EAT. That's, yes. uh, you know, narrated by Alex from A Clockwork Orange. That's right. That's right. And so... I, I've only seen about half of it. Some Someone uploaded it to Facebook. Yeah, I, I, I think I've seen that too. Um, so I grew up watching that and that's how I got a lot of my first like tidbits of like Beatles trivia and like learning the backstory and then my dad also had the Imagine John Lennon documentary on VHS as well <laughs> so those were basically the building blocks of my Beatlemania were all of those movies and I think that's why I'm such a visual learner like I have Beatle books I've never read them uh, I, I I have zero attention span okay. for Beatle books. See, I, I, I can't comment on that because I have a lot of authors who come on my show and full disclosure, I get sent books occasionally. Yeah. So I can't say whether or not I, I read Beatle books or whether or not I know how to read, you know. <laughs> I can read. I just choose yeah. not to. Exactly. No, I mean, I, I try. I just yeah. like my friend I'm calls me I'm... borderline illiterate because of my, <laughs> you know, before my complete apathy towards books. He's like, Ethan, yeah. you dumbass! You have a shelf full of Beetle books, and it's like, yeah. It's like, have you read them? Some of them. No, I'm totally the same way. Of course, you know people get me Beatles anything for, for gifts, especially family. It's like, oh, I saw this Beatle book. Here you go. And I'm like, great, I'm never going to read this. Yeah. <laughs> because with, with Beatle books, they're, they're like a couple levels. It's like there's those introductory books that just like are called like the Beatles, you know, the history or you know, the story. And it's, you know, basically a picture book. Yeah. It's like here That's for like the little little kids. Well not even little kids, but just like, you know, the 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 teenagers just getting into the Beatles. And then but then as you go further and further down the rabbit hole, it's like complete Beatles recording sessions, uh recording the Beatles. The books by all their associates, you know. Yeah. Like Jeff Emmerich and uh what's this? Tony Bramwell, all those I have his book. Oh yeah. <laughs> But then, yeah, it's just that nightmare rabbit hole. Yeah, for sure. No, I get all of my information from documentaries and biopics and things like that. That's how I learned everything. Uh, and, of course, back when I was a kid, you know, VH1 was the best way to get any kind of musical information, you know, pre-internet. Oh. Well, I shouldn't say pre-internet, but, like... Before it really exploded. Well, what kind of what kind of Beatles stuff would VH1 show? Because I, I know oh, there was man. no behind the music. No, there was never a behind a behind the music or a pop up video. But any well, there of was their, a pop up like... video, sort of. I've seen it. Oh, but it's all solo stuff. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Um, any of their top 100 countdowns that they would do, like the greatest moments in rock and roll history or yeah. whichever one Mark McGrath was hosting <laughs> that week, um, would have, you know, some Beatle tidbits in there. And um, John Lennon had a behind the music and Julian Lennon had a behind the music. Uh, um, but that's about it. So, yeah. Well, what... What does being a Beatle fan mean to you? Oh, man, that's a loaded question. I know. I, I don't know who I would be as a person if the Beatles weren't in my life. Like, because... In what ways would you say, like, the Beatles have impacted your life? Like, what things do you do that you would not have done, you know, if well, you for were one, a slightly I lesser fan? I wouldn't have a Beatle job. Yeah, <laughs> So, you know, I wouldn't be working at the Hard Rock for as long as I did. I wouldn't be doing social media for Joe Johnson's Beatle Brunch, you know. And a lot of the things, like, 
you know, deep within the songs, you know, the philosophy of it all, you know, being good to people and peace and love and all that stuff. And I certainly wouldn't be a musician. I picked up a pair of drumsticks because I wanted to be Ringo. Exactly. Me too. (laughs) Yeah. Like the reason why I also picked up a guitar is because I wanted to be John Lennon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're just, they have so much influence on everything I do, everything I've done, and everything that I will do in my life is because of those guys. Now, I, I want to ask you do, you, do you do, like, the Beatle Fests? Yeah, yeah, I've been going since I was six. Oh, Jesus. Uh, so, like, I, I, I'm i ashamed to say, again, I've said it before on the show, my first fest was the 2019 Chicago Fest. Okay. But, you know, what are, do you have any particular favorite memories of Beetlefest past? Um, so you know, I've only I, been... I think this I've... is why Mark Lapidos likes me so much. It's because <laughs> I, I do a lot of free publicity. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. Beetlefest is the bomb. Yeah, fuck, go listen to my Mark Lapidos episode. I need to. No, I need to. Um, I'm friends with his daughter, Michelle. She's amazing. Um... Oh, God. Beetlefest memories, man. Uh, so I've only been to a handful of fests, uh, which is funny because I grew up out on Long Island, New York. You would think that my parents would want to take me to Beetlefest every year. No, they wanted no part with it. I had to beg to go to my first Beetlefest in 1996 in New Jersey. Um, <laughs> and that was that was a fun experience uh though i don't remember too much of it i remember that they used to do the laser light show oh wow back in the day and that was a really cool memory that sounds uh, that's bitching oh it was and that's kind of one of my only other memories of beetle fest 96 oh and they had the cardboard cutouts that you could take pictures with and my brother and i dressed up uh in the sergeant pepper shirts and stood next to the cardboard cutout and got a polaroid taken that was cool uh <laughs> and i got my first beetle t-shirt at beetle fest and i still have it it's a yellow submarine shirt it's tie-dye with the boys on the front in cartoon form and then them from the all together now segment on the back and it says we all live in a yellow submarine oh man i it, it really sucks that my first one was like the last one before corona yeah because you know i i got to meet so many wonderful people like you know my dear friend kiddo tool yeah uh, i met for the first time ken womack uh, I, I got to stalk Mark Lewison all weekend. <laughs> yeah, um, the only other fests that I've been to, I went to the 2008 fest in Las Vegas. Now, that was incredible. Oh. That was my present for graduating high school. I got to go on that trip, so we went to go see Love and went to Beetlefest. See, that's one of the rite of passages that I personally have not done. I have not seen love. Oh, man. That's because I I haven't been to Las Vegas since, like, I was seven. Well, it sucks that Cirque du Soleil, because of COVID, uh, went out of business. Wait, what? Yeah. They they shut down, so no more Cirque du Soleil. You you fucking serious? Like, no more love? Yep. Oh, my God. Yep, all of their shows are done, so I don't know... If and when they do recover, if they'll bring back any of their old shows or just have new ones. Uh, But everything that was associated with Cirque du Soleil, which includes things like Blue Man Group, all done. All donezo. COVID fucked it all up. Hold on. I hear hear you typing away. I'm in denial right now. Like, you you don't believe me, sir. It's still still on their website. Oh, (laughs) I'm really upset now. No, um, well, because we have Blue Man Group and a Cirque du Soleil show here in Orlando, and all of that went under. Oh, my God. I, this is, that ruined my night. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Ah, c'est la vie. It's not like I wanted to see a bunch of mimes anyways. No, but the show is so good. I've seen it twice. It's amazing. And each time you go, you see it from a different Caitlin, angle. I'm and you trying see to justify new, myself for not seeing it. 
<laughs> so stop saying good things about it. I mean, it's the worst show ever, and the music sucks. Don't go fucking spend your money on that piece of shit show. The the most, I my mom went to Vegas and she got me a pair of Love drumsticks. That's cool. Um, and I have the Love album. Oh man, the store that's in the Mirage okay. though is like a Beetle Don't Heaven. Don't start. I haven't gone there. <laughs> now I'm getting really upset. All right, Ethan, just musfraba in through the nose, out through the mouth. It's uh, going to be okay. Even that love album I have, I'm one of those like obnoxious pricks who like bought the record and said, like, I'm not going to open this. You know, it's worth more if it's sealed. Dude, I don't even have it on vinyl. I only have it on CD. There, there are two different vinyl versions. Like, you can find one, like, you know, everywhere, like, oh, I keep forgetting what the big, like, American record store chain is. I, I go there all the time when I'm in the States, like, in the malls. Uh, we don't have them anymore. We used to have Sam Goody back in the day. That's, uh, F F Y E. Oh, F Y E. Yeah. yeah, sure. It's like, they have one that you can find, like, F Y E, but I have the original one from 2007. That's nice. apparently kind of rare. It's like, I'm not opening this. Don't. It's worth more. Yeah. <laughs> but then again, it's like, y you paid you paid high double digits for something that is just going to sit on your shelf. Most of the time, you will, let, you will see less than an inch of it, spine-wise. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing about being a collector. And I collect all sorts of things, not just, you know, vinyl. I mean, whether it be toys, memorabilia, whatever. Well, I, I had to curb that. Because like, I, I used to buy, you know, when I had other interests in life, uh, Funko Pops. and. Oh, know. dude, you should see my Funko collection. I have, like, over 200. Oh, Jesus. Well, yeah. I do have four Funko Pops. Do you want to take a guess who they are? Let's see. Uh, Weird Al Yankovic. Jimi Hendrix. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, that I was. it was more of like a right place at the right time kind of thing. Because apparently they're really rare now. Yes, they are now. The cool thing about those Yellow Submarine Funkos, they were the one of the very first uh, ones to ever come out. And they were selling them at Barnes and Noble here in Orlando. And this was back in 2012. And I think it was the first Christmaca that my wife and I celebrated together when we first started dating. And she got me all five Funkos. So John Paul, George and Ringo and the Blue I, Meanie. I don't have the Blue Meanie. Yeah, they're all on my shelf in the living room and in the box, of course. Yeah. Well, the um, boxes have seen love a little bit things. better days because um, I I got them all at, uh, for those of you in, in New York City, um, there used to be a big uh, electronics, or I don't know if it still exists, called J&R. And I went there once on vacation and I was blown away because it was like, you know, CD, new record mecca. And they had, uh, you know, piles and piles of these Beatles Funko Pops. And I'm like, oh, I'll get John. And then, you know, I'm like, should I get the others? No, I'm just going to get John. And then the next day it's like, nope, I have to get the other three. It's a good thing you did. Those are yeah. super hard to come by. But I love them. They plastered all these JNR stickers on the top with these, you know. Oh, no. So I, I t took them off. So there's, there's some wear and tear. You know what? At that point, when the box is ruined, you just got to take them out of the box. Well, I mean, you're not going to sell them. It, it's only the tops that are kind of a little worn. Yeah. But, you know, I, I put them in the box protectors. They're sitting in my display cabinet. It's it's all good. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, I definitely need a new apartment because the walls are just exploding with like all the toys and collectibles between both my wife and myself um do you want to hear it, the most ludicrous collectible i had at one point yes okay Tell me. it's not beatles related um i had not one but two mighty morphin power rangers morphers okay um <laughs> yeah and they these were like die cast metal you know like expensive Word. Uh, I don't have them anymore because they were taking up space. 
and I I redirected that money into my uh, record buying addiction. Sure, sure, been there. It probably turned into <laughs> one of my ten copies of Rubber Soul. Oh man, it's a black hole. Whew. It, it it gets to a point where it's almost not fun anymore. Nah, I, I I've gotten worse with quarantine, and of course, you know, doing my Back to the Future podcast has not helped at all. I went from only having like four Back to the Future things ever to now the desk where I'm at, like it's exploding. It's just all Back to the Future stuff here in front of me. <laughs> I. There are so many, like, Beetle knickknacks that they put on the market these days. It's too much. I can't well, buy it all. Well, th- that, that's where I'm at, though. It's like, if I can't buy them all, I'm not going to buy any of them. Yeah, I kind of I kind of feel you there. It, have, it has like, to be something really, yeah. really good for me to go out and spend my money on it. Because there's just so much. The, the last new thing I got was the Lego Yellow Submarine. Really? Yeah. Okay, that came out a while back. That was like 2016, I think. Or 2017, I don't know. But I'm trying to, uh, does this not include vinyl? Cuz I'm like or, you know, box sets or anything cuz oh, like those are the well. most recent like purchases for me. Okay, well like, that I, that's I can't... a different ball ballpark. Yeah, cuz I can't think of like Beetle knickknacks. What was the last thing that I got? I can't remember. Oh, God, Beetle box sets. Yeah, because the last thing I got, of course, was the Give Me Some Truth CD set for my birthday. The thing is, I, I'm, I'm conflicted on Give Me Some Truth. Yeah? I, I'm not a big fan of the remixes. No? I like a couple of them. Like, I, I I was really blown away on Record Store Day when they put out the Instant Karma one. I listened to that and I thought, this is phenomenal. And then I listened to the other ones, especially the mid-70s like mind games walls and bridges era stuff and it's i feel like the mixes are neutered huh, they stripped away to... like all the phil specter wall of sound stuff that i love i'll have to give it another listen because i only really listen to like half of it in the car through spotify to be completely honest because of course we only get the collector box sets to uh, get the books and all the pictures and stuff yeah right <laughs> of course well, it's it's also been kind of challenging these past few years when they've been doing those album boxes. Right? Oh, man. Like, I was man. this close to buying the big six CD Sgt. Pepper one, but then I noticed they were all on Spotify, so I didn't really care. Yeah, no, I, I have to have at least the big deluxe set. Well, the collector in me is like, okay, I don't need all the different vinyl variations. I don't need all the different stuff. I just need the one ultimate thing. And it's funny because I don't even play any of it <laughs> on a CD player. I listen to it all still on Spotify. But because yeah. the collector in me is like, I have to fucking have this. I have it. Yeah. <laughs> like For the last ones, I haven't bought the CDs, but I've bought like the utmost vinyl versions so right. like the 2lp sergeant pepper the 4lp white album well it's funny because for those just to get the companion little posters that come with it i'll get the like uh for sergeant pepper and abbey road anyway i got the 1lp just so that i could get the free poster that came with it free poster oh well, that the record store would give away the the lithograph thing. See, I I bought it too late. I I got the two LP one, and by the time I had got it, it was already get going out of print. Right. And, but luckily, a local record store still had it at retail price, and weirdly, it holds such a sentimental value to me, because that was the first record I bought after my dad passed away. Oh. And so that whole week with. There was, like, the funeral and the wake, and it was all really depressing. Friday, I'm like, you know what? You don't have to go to a funeral today. You're going to a record store, and you're buying that Sgt. Pepper. And I still haven't listened to it. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Hey, retail therapy, man. It's all you need. Don't even get me started on retail therapy. 
<laughs> like last night on an impulse, I was just like, because I was stressed about the elections, like, uh, uh, uh. Okay, well, that kind of dates uh, the episode. Uh, yes, we are recording on November 4th. Um, yeah, and it's nice that you're stressed about the election and you don't even live here, man. Oh, yeah. But, so I impulse bought the Phil Spector Christmas album off of Discogs. Oh, geez, nice. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, record collecting is, you know, one of my many mental illnesses. No, it's so funny. Like, since the pandemic started, I really haven't gone crazy with records. I went to my local record show uh, about a month ago. Wait, you're having record so- shows again? Dude, I live in Florida. We suck. Okay. <laughs> That's right, I forgot. You, Nobody fl- pays attention to any of the guidelines. Like, I didn't stay there for long because people were just not sanitary and... Yeah. People were wearing their masks, but they were standing awful close, yeah. and I couldn't handle it. So I basically got what I wanted, and I got the hell out of there. Um, Luckily, I think my record buying habit got worse, and it wasn't even online. It was still kind of in person because yeah. I, I hooked up with this guy in Toronto who like exclusively sells British pressings, and so when I would get my you know uh, survivor's pension from my dad. I would, you know, like, okay, let me go to his website. What do I want? Uh, Days of Future Past uh, by the Moody Blues, uh, King Crimson, uh, the Rolling Stones, uh, High Tide and Green Grass. And I would just, like, you know, go crazy. Um, and, yeah, it's... But luckily, Toronto, or for the most part here, uh, record buying is fairly sanitary now. Cause, That's good. Well, like... For some of my favorite stores in Toronto, there's like a there's a cap at like four people in the store at the same time. Yeah, I haven't ventured out to any of my local record stores yet because they are on the other side of town. And the record show I went to was literally around the corner from where I live. So it was more convenient for me, I suppose. Um, but I definitely need to venture back out, I suppose. Uh, well... For Record Store Day, when Instant Karma came out, my store was kind enough that they were doing, um, you know, postage. They were shipping them in the mail. So after, like, the people who, they did, like, a raffle where, you know, only a certain amount of people could come in and do the whole Record Store Day experience. Mm -hmm. And then they would put the rest on their website. So that's how I was able to get the Instant Karma 45 And then I really didn't care too much to get the new McCartney. Well, the thing is, uh, in Canada, and I noticed some places else around the world, the McCartney one didn't come out on uh, Record Store Day 2. It came out on Record Store Day 1. Like, I don't know how or why, but I was able to get it at the same time as the Instant Karma one. Right. I saw your thing with uh, Kit and Tom. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found that funny that they brought me on to talk about just one record. Well, hey, because you got it before the rest of us. Yeah, but it's not that special. Well, not that it's not that special, but, you know, got to get somebody's opinion on yeah. it. L- lo- love you, Talk More Talk, guys. Uh, don't take that as an insult. Love you, Tom. Love you, Kit. Yes. Yeah, look forward to my episode of Talk More Talk. I, I, I just say that kind of willing it to in it or willing it into existence. That's basically how you have to do things. I'm the same way. I'm like, if I say it out loud, that means it's really going to happen. And if you say it out loud and then publish it, then it's on record. Or tweet it or tweet. to Paul McCartney every single time you're like, I had a dream where I met Paul McCartney. When are we going to make this real, homie? Yeah. Well, Paul pointed <laughs> to me at a concert, so I'm I'm, you know, thrilled with that. I have had, I've been lucky to have a couple of instances where Paul and I have made eye contact directly. It, it was glorious. Paul gave me an air, f- like, fist in the air, like, kind of fist bump thing. Because I was wearing my Sergeant Pepper jacket, my blue Sergeant Pepper jacket. to the As you should. To the concert I saw in Hamilton, Ontario. It was actually funny walking into that thing. I thought, you know, I was, I'm just going to be so unique. Like, I'm wearing a fucking Sergeant Pepper suit. 
and like as I got out of the car, I saw like a little girl like standing down just a little bit down the street, also wearing one. Don't you hate cute little kids? Well, they ruin everything for everybody. Mine looked much better, and I think she was more upset than anything because she was like, "Oh, you've got to be fucking kidding me!" Oh, that's yeah. hilarious. Well, you know, don't play the. I almost said, "Don't play the hair." Uh, don't hate the player, hate the game. Oh. Yeah. There you go. I, I've i completely lost my train of thought. We were yeah. going through your usual questions, and then we went on a half hour long tangent, so. Well, let's continue this tangent. I want to talk about records, because I love talking about let's records. Let's do it. Uh, what is your favorite, uh, like, Beatle record you own? Like, or, or it also, like, could be your rarest Beatle record. Probably my copy of um, the VJ45 of Do You Want to Know a Secret? Oh, you lucky fucker. Yeah, I snagged that on eBay. Does it have Um, the picture sleeve? It sure does. Now, the thing is, the reason why it was so cheap is because the person who probably owned it back in the 60s wrote John, Paul, George, and Ringo on their heads. Oh. But it's only on one side. The other side looks great. And the record plays beautifully. So if you can get over little things like that, like that shit's rare. Oh, you yeah. don't see those every day. You know, so just because it says John Paul, George, and Ringo on their heads, I'm like, whatever. This is still freaking awesome. So I bought it. I, I've only really started buying like the U.S. singles like about a year ago because, well, especially with those early ones, it's so daunting because every time you hear about them, it's like, now you have to be sure that it's not a bootleg or a counterfeit version because there were like 24 yeah, billion the... counterfeit VJs and swans and tollies. It's so funny. Anytime I'm in a record store and I stumble upon something like that, I try to go through my Rolodex of Beatles YouTube friends <laughs> to be like, hey, is this legit? Is this fake? Like, somebody help me out. So I'll message like all the people you see out yeah. there on YouTube and just pray and pray that somebody will write me back. It's usually almost always Mr. Beatles Pro. Yeah. I don't know if you I, uh, I watch his, his channel. I watch his stuff. Yeah, Tom is amazing. Shout out to Tom, Mr. Beatles Pro. Uh, if you don't watch his well, stuff on YouTube, you should. I, I, t- I um, take a different philosophy. Um, unless I know it's real, I'm not going to go through the effort of making sure it's real. Well, ha- I need to know before I buy it. See, I, I'm not... I guess that that schooled uh, yeah. on well, it's, the different. I'm not even that schooled either. Stuff I don't it's know. Like un, I unless I trust trust the seller, and he's like, "This is real. It, it's not a counterfeit version." See, I know that I can't trust my seller. Yeah. <laughs> well, because they're trying to make a quick buck. Well, but uh, I I do trust. Or there's a great store in Buffalo because he had like you know about 10 different swan she loves yous uh all different labels and it's like no this this one's a real one and so it's like okay fuck buddy i'll take your word plus it it came with the picture sleeve so nice i I got that yeah i have one that wait is it she loves you but some some i'm blanking on what's in my collection right now name on the cover in the 60s boo boo but luckily, I, I feel like 45s are like the last frontier where you can still get deals. Those are probably my favorite things to collect. Uh, I'm a big picture sleeve lover. Like, so those are oh, the things that I always gravitate towards. Dude, um, like last year and uh, this January, that store in Buffalo had like been about six bins of Beetle 45s. Wow. And there was at least one copy of each single that had like a really or a decent picture sleeve. But and here's the kicker. They were only about five to ten bucks each. Nice. So I was able to snag, uh, you know, over the course of, you know, a, a two or three visits, about 15 of the U.S. picture sleeve. Oh, my God. Jeez. <laughs> so I went from having just love me do to having nearly the full set. 
Wow, yeah, see, it's very hard to come across Beetle 45s down here for whatever reason that is, I don't know. And I'm not going to really go all out and go on eBay and be like, oh my god, I have to get every single one. I'm more the type of person, if I come across it, I'm gonna pick it up. See, I, I, that's the thing I don't like about, like, eBay. I, the, the types of eBay posts I get really excited about are lots, where right. I can get a bunch of things at once. Yep, I do that too. Yeah. So one of the most common things I do is just beetle lots, enter. And then it's like, oh, look at this. 15 Dutch 45s, $250. I'm not going to buy that, but that's cool. Yeah. Oh, the struggles. The struggles mm. of being a record collector. Yeah, it's... It's miserable, but it's fun. Yeah. Especially when it gets to the point where it's like, you're you're looking for things like shrink wrap and like, oh, how sharp are the corners on this one? It's, it, you, you get to a point where it's less like music and it's more like stamp collecting. Yeah. But, say la vie. Say la vie. Now, I will go back to some of my normal questions. <laughs> let's go let's do it what are what is one of your favorite memories in life that have that has involved the Beatles in some way or another oh man I have so many you, you can pick a few <laughs> you can pick a few we got time um definitely those car rides with my family listening to Beatles music uh, I think that's definitely one of my all-time favorite memories um seeing Paul McCartney in concert six times uh, is pretty amazing. Or the time that I stalked him at a restaurant and went up to his table. That was a good time. Did you meet and him? I got sh what? I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't get to meet him. But I stood about two feet away from him and his brother-in-law shooed me away from the table. It was great. Oh, wow. Yeah, good times. Fun. I actually have a full video of that story <laughs> on my YouTube channel. <laughs> so if you want to oh. uh, hear my, my Paul McCartney story in more depth. Uh, check it out on my YouTube channel. Oh my god, I'm I'm watching that. Yeah, definitely for sure. It's one of the first videos I ever did. Oh, you said, um, you know, car rides with your family, listening to the music. Yeah. I I forgot to ask you, what was the first Beatle album that you ever owned? Ooh, you know what? I'm not too sure because I always had my parents' collection, and then I slowly gar I started getting my own CDs, and I think the first CD that was mine was for my 10th birthday um in 99 was when the yellow submarine song track came out mm -hmm. that was my first Beatles cd the the funny thing is like to to a lot of this community we're the young ones but we yes. have very different terms or uh beetle fandom experiences yeah, for sure. Because I've never known a time before the 2009 remasters. Right. Oh my god, I'll never forget. There was such yeah. hype going on for that. Like, I, I go to record stores and I get excited when I see the ones in the jewel cases. Because it's like, ooh, uh, an antiquity. Yeah, I have all of those. Well, I, I a couple months ago during the quarantine, I bought the, do you know the bread box? Like the roll top box from like the 80s. Yes, yes, yes. Got one of those. Wow. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just, it just randomly popped into my head, but another great memory I have, you know, and I guess I'm, I'm lucky, even though I was a, a small child, to have been around to see that um, was when the Beatles anthology came on TV for the very first time in 1995. And uh, that was the first time I was like, oh my God, this is a historic Beatle moment, and I'm alive for it because, you know, I was born almost 20 years after the Beatles broke up. So I remember that being super significant to me, even as a six year old kid. Well, I'm jealous of you in that regard because, like, I don't think I've lived through many significant Beatle events that I've been, like, cognizant of as a Beatle fan. Yeah, you know, I no, I wasn't, um, you know, I got into them, like the the big thing that happened when I got into them is when they went to iTunes, like that was within sure. like a month or two of really getting into them, 
So I, I, my mom already had the blue album. I went out and bought the red album. Um, the red, like the red and the blue had just been reissued in those like digi packs. Wow. Um, and yeah. No, but I remember when the Beatles anthology happened and it was such a big deal. And, uh, it was funny because my parents at the time were on a vacation in Cancun, Mexico, and they missed the whole thing. They didn't get to see any of those episodes. And of course, this was before they ever put it on tape or DVD. So you could only see it on TV. And my grandparents who were babysitting my brother and I were kind enough to let my brother and I, you know, stay up and watch it. Um, And it's funny because my grandfather was so not a Beatles fan at all, but my grandmother was. And And so they taped it it for your parents? No. Oh. They missed it. (laughs) My my parents, to this day, still have not seen the Beatles anthology, even though I own it on DVD. Lend them the DVD. I would love to. They just don't have the patience to watch 11 hours of the Beatles. It, it took me a while. Um, I, I didn't own a copy of the DVD until, like, last year. Uh, and even then, it only took until quarantine when nothing was going on. And it's like, okay... You know, I'll, I'll, I'll watch him. Oh, man. So I think I got my first copy of the Beatles anthology on DVD. I want to say this must have been around 2005, 2006, maybe? When it first came out on DVD, I think. I could be wrong. Oh, um, but the thing is, I've played it so much that maybe about four years ago the DVDs just wouldn't play when I would put them in the player. So two years ago for Christmas, my wife got me a brand new set. So I've burned out one set of anthology DVDs because I play it so often. Oh, this has nothing to do with how much I've played it, but uh, like the, the DVD case on a couple of the discs is like cracked. And so it, it kills me. Oh, I got a great story for you that just popped into my head. Please share. So so the Beatles anthology had just come out on CD. Okay. So the the special had already aired on TV, and they started coming out on CD. And they had different release dates. So I remember that the first one came out whenever it did, and my dad bought it. Yeah. So, but it came out like a few weeks or a few months apart, disc one, uh, anthology one, two, and three. I know two and three came out in 96. Yeah, so um, my dad got the very first one, and I'll never forget, it. Beatles Anthology 2 had dropped, and I was at the mall with my family, and I was like, oh my god, Beatles Anthology 2 came out, we gotta get it, we gotta get it, and my dad was just like, no, we're not fucking buying it, and I'm hysterical crying in the middle of a Sam Goody. <laughs> So, like, hysterical crying that my parents will not buy this Anthology 2 CD. So much so that I wouldn't let go of it. And my parents were walking out of the store, so I almost, like, shoplifted it. I took it out of the store in my hands, hysterical crying. (laughs) Oh, man, I haven't thought about that in years. (laughs) Well, for years, like, the anthology DVD was one of those, like, top shelf items that, like, you would see in, like, a, I don't know, like a Sam Goody type place. Like, there was that, like, the Beatles CD, EP, and singles box. Those yeah. Capital Albums boxes. It's like, you know, you, you had the money to buy, like, a normal CD, but you're like, oh, mom, can you please buy me that? And she's like, no, it's not your birthday or Christmas. See, by the time that those started coming out, I was, you know, a teenager and had, you know, jobs already and was able to spend my money on those kinds of things. I, I'll never forget, I bought a Nintendo Wii just so I could play Beatles Rock Band. <laughs> that, that's the only video game I've ever bought in my entire life. You've all, you bought a Wii just yep. to buy Rock Band. And I beat it in one day. I mean, I, I bought the Rock Band uh, and just used my brother's Xbox. Just because I wanted the, the guitar and the drums. 
Yeah, well, we'll see. I'm not a gamer or anything. I've never been into video games. That was always my big brother's uh, wheelhouse. Well, I, I'm not and... a huge gamer either. Like, the only system I own is a little tiny Super Nintendo Classic where I can play nice. where I... I can play my Mario games. Oh, we're we're the same on that level. Uh, we have uh, an NES Classic as well, and we only just recently got a Nintendo Switch because my wife wanted to play Mario Kart. <laughs> well, it's, um, I'll say this. I hacked my SNES Classic so I can play any NES or SNES or Sega Genesis game I want. Nice. Yeah. Hashtag piracy. Yes. I, I shouldn't say that because Nintendo's lawyers are very litigious. And while I'm not scared of the Beatles lawyers too much, I'm scared of Nintendo. Oh, yeah, you should be. It'd be funny if I got a cease and desist for this show from Nintendo before I got one from the Beatles. Oh, my goodness. That would just be amazing. <laughs> so, I, I want to ask you a bit of a deep question. We, Go we for it. We kind of talked about this before the show. Um, you you and I are, are, are different in a couple aspects. Um do you ever, like, feel discriminated in this, like, Beatle world? Well, I, I don't know if... W would discriminated be the right word for being, like, a younger female fan? I don't know if discrimination is really yeah. the, I, I don't the know right word. I, I, I know where you're coming yeah. from, but I, I don't... I don't think... I've never been discriminated against as a young girl who likes the Beatles in... A fandom where it's always much older men. Um, but the thing is, is that I was always like, okay, I don't want these guys to think that I'm just some basic bitch fan. Which was why I always studied up. And I always had to be like, okay, I have to prove that I'm just as worthy of being called a Beatle fan as anybody else and it's kind of funny because that's kind of how I got the nickname the beetle nut by the age of 10 because I was beating grown-ups at Beatles trivia wow you know like that's I would I wouldn't call it discriminatory but I'm sure that I, I, I'm you know, not there sure are if other that was the right that, word no but I totally know what you're what you mean um and I'm sure that there are other women my age that have probably been discriminated against or like been... not taken seriously. Yeah, exactly. Not taken seriously at all as a Beatles fan. And, you know, people look at me and they're like, oh, you know, hey, they're, you know, cute little girl. Like, what do you know about the Beatles? And I'm like, dude, I can run circles around you. <laughs> you can. <laughs> and, oh, thank you. Um... And I don't know, it's just, I've always had to, to prove myself, I guess, in that regard. I, I still have to prove myself because I was a young fan. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's... I mean, I, I feel you. Yeah. Um, we're, we're in a fandom where a lot of these folks who were alive when the Beatles were around and you know if I were yeah. them I would be stubborn yeah. too you know and, and they take it seriously it can unfortunately and be a little gatekeepy for beginners yeah that's a that's a good way to describe it for sure and um it's just about like passing it along and you know teaching the next generation of fans it, about the Beatles don't mock the young fans for not no. Knowing that John called an emergency band meeting in 1968 strung out on heroin to let them know that he was the reincarnation of Jesus. It's your duty to tell them that. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to educate the new generation. Don't don't discriminate. Educate. That's right. There we go. We, we just solved it. I think we just figured out Blue's Clues, as they say. <laughs> Oh, okay, you're you're <laughs> unlocking some memories I forgot I had. Oh, there you go. okay. Now here is where it gets fun. This is where it gets. All right, let's do it. I I like to call this segment the quick fire questions. Although go. although the questions are quick, the answers are always often not. 
What is your favorite Beatles song? Oh, come on, Ethan. <laughs> oh. Usually I say you can pick usually I say you can pick more than one, but I'm not gonna be that fair today. Okay. Because we don't live in a fair world. No, we don't. We don't live in a fair world. Um, I gravitate towards the early stuff. So I'm definitely an early Beatles fan as opposed to the later stuff. Um, I would say some of my favorite tracks are things like I'll Get You, Thank You Girl, okay. Hold Me Tight. I'm actually really glad that you said those two in particular because a previous guest on my show, Sam Wiles, I'm fucking talking to you. He, he specifically said those two songs as ones he hates. And I, I <gasps> fucking shouted him out. I'm like, oh, go fuck yourself. Those yeah, two. Yeah, go fuck yourself. I don't know who you are, but go fuck yourself. Those two are <laughs> among my favorites. Absolutely. I, I went through such an I'll get you kick over like the past year or so. Like I never paid that song much attention, but then, you know, it suddenly clicked. Uh. So I had never heard that song before until um, Capital came out with, you know, the Capital Albums Volume 1 because I was raised on the British yes. versions with the CDs, which is so weird because my parents totally were raised on the regular U.S. records. Yeah. But for some reason, I had just never heard that song until the Capital Volume 1 Four CD set came out. What, what album and when is I it heard, on? Is it like it's on the Beatles', Beatles second, second album. album. And when I heard that for the first time, I was like, "How have I never heard this song before? It's fucking amazing." I think that's actually how I first heard it too on that Capital CD set. Um, in that you know shitty Capital Dave Dexter Jr. duophonic stereo, but yeah. it sounds like I. I don't know what it is, but some of those, like, really shitty Beatles, like, Capitol songs from the 60s, I really like the sound of them. I love them. I love them so much. And it's like they're simple, but they're so catchy. And it's stuff that just gets stuck in your head all day. And the harmonies are beautiful. And the little guitar licks, even though they're so simple and, you know... Oh, I, I can't describe it. It just, it gives me such a good feeling, you know? And that's really all this is. You know, people get so, you know, stuck on like, oh, well, I like this because this, 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 and this, and this, and this. And I'm like, no, nah, that's not the way I do stuff. And if you watch any of my YouTube videos, like, I'm the worst at reviewing things because I'm just like, yo, I like this because I think it's good. That's kind of how you I know? am, too. <laughs> that's the only way I can describe it. It just gives you a good, it, genuine It releases the feeling. serotonin into your brain. Yeah. That makes you go happy. When yep. they go, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> God. So does that mean your vote is for I'll get you? Ooh, I don't. Well, like I was saying, it was like, I'll get you, thank you, girl, um, hold me tight, what you're doing, every little thing. I mean, those are definitely, uh, those are my tunes. Those okay. are my jams. I, I don't know if I can choose, man. Okay. I can't. We can we can keep it at a top four. All right. Sounds good. On the flip side, pun intended. Yes. What is your least favorite Beatles song? Is revolution number nine a good answer, or it's, is that like vetoed? It's a bit of, it's a, bit of a cop out. Unless you're Damn unless it. you're a not physically able to come up with another one. Um, let me. I, think I find about it hard to believe that there's like a Beatles song, or there that there isn't a Beatles song that you're like. Oh, I, there, I don't there, like it. See, there are Beatles songs that. I love them, but if I hear them on the radio, I'm just like, oh, I can't listen to this shit again. Like, let, like let me the, guess. the typical, Let yep. me guess. Hey Jude? Yep. Uh, let It Be? Yep. Yesterday? Yep. Long and Winding Road? Actually, no, I, I like that song a lot. Okay, that's where <laughs> that's we That's not that's one I where usually we tend to skip. That's the only song where I will skip. Really? Uh, 
I was on the way home from work today. Hey Jude popped up on the radio and I said, fuck, I can't do this. And I turned it well, off. That's what I like about the, the Beatles Sirius XM channel. But even then they still play those songs all well, the time. I, I w- no, I was listening to Sirius XM. Oh my God. Oh, and All You Need Is Love. That's another one. I'm If I hear it, I just like, I can't. Is that one like a, a more popular radio staple where you are? No, it, I, I only ever listen to Sirius XM. Oh, okay. Which is horrible because I, I work in radio. Um, <laughs> oh, man. But, ah, God. I, I like it when they play the deep cuts, but, you know, for a fucking Beatles radio station, at least play the deep cuts more than you play the regular stuff. Well, the thing like, is... I, I get now, really excited when they play, like, you right, know, the BBC now, stuff. I do too. Live at the BBC, Volume 1 and Volume 2 is the only CD that I actually have in my car. Like, I I wasn't alive for Volume 1, but I remember when Volume 2 came out, because I had already had Volume 1, and I was so excited. Like, I remember driving out to HMV and, and buying it. Yeah, no, that's, that's probably some of my, that's my favorite era of the Beatles, right there are in those amazing BBC recordings. I could so listen your, to them for days. So your favorite era of Beatle is like mid to late 63? I would say anywhere from 63 to 65 is like, oh, it's just so good. So apart from those uh, songs that you're you're sick of, do you have a least favorite? Or, or will you be a cop out? Oh, man. Hold on. I feel like I have to, like, I have to look at the track listings and just be like, all right, uh, maybe, maybe that one, or, um, uh, da 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 This is enthralling for our listeners. I bet. Yeah. No, you better edit the silence oh, out. Oh, I'm, I'm not um, editing any, any of this out. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> um, I mean, does anybody like Dig It? Nobody likes Dig there, It, right? There you go. You can say Dig It. Sure. Dig It. Now, what is your favorite Beatles album? My favorite Beatles album. There's Oof. a running joke on this See, show that there's a correct answer. Oh, really? Um, but I won't tell you what the correct answer is. Okay. So for a long time, I used to say that Please Please Me was my favorite Beatles album. That wasn't the right answer. Be- because, like, you could just go through that album and there's not one song that you could skip. Fun- funny enough, you should say that. Um, I did a little um, calculation based on previous uh, answers of past fans on the run guess of what their least favorite Beatle album is. And Please Please Me came in second. What the hell is wrong with people? I The thing <laughs> is, I don't disagree with them. Oh, man, come on. Um, but I was going to say, as of late, an album that I've been gravitating to more, and it's one that I gravitated to when I started getting Beatles CDs as a kid, is with the Beatles. Okay, that's that's a solid... I, I like it more than I like Please Please Me. It's it's a yeah. solid album. Oh, it's so good. It's, to me, I'll forever associate that with uh, taking my... Like, the first Beatles CDs I owned of the, of the catalog was because I, I had gotten like a good report card in school and my mom ordered me the Beatles in Mono CD box set. Nice. And so I remember driving with my dad up to up to our cottage, just listening to some of those CDs. And I just remember it being like pitch black driving up. You Canadians know uh, the drive or driving to like Muskoka. It, it's like, you know, cottage country. And, Ooh. you know, and just listening to like Devil in Her Heart and All I've Got to Do. I'll forever associate it with that. No. And now, what is your least favorite Beatles album? My least favorite Beatles Actually, album I, is Let... I should oh. at least tell you what the correct answer was. Oh, what is the right Revolver. answer? 
Oh, that's definitely up there for yeah. me. It's one of my absolute it, it favorites. It came in tied at number one at the with the same calculations. Because I, I, I actually set aside a day where I went through every single past episode and wrote down what each guest's favorite, least favorite album and song were. And I, I did some, you know, calculations and spreadsheets. And Revolver and Rubber Soul were tied for number one. Wow. Although no, it doesn't are... count because Rubber Soul was split between the UK and the US. So really, I shouldn't have let it count. Well, if you want to get technical. Yeah, because <laughs> Revolver's my favorite, and I was upset that it had to share the spot. <laughs> okay, what's your least favorite? Let it that be. That is also the correct answer for least yes, favorite Yes, I think that's uh, everybody's least favorite. Oh, fuck. I, you know... I don't like that album very much. I, I don't either. And it's funny because if you t look at it and you take the tracks individually, it's like, man, there's some good songs on here. Well, but I, it's just One of my past like, guests said to me, like, don't think about it as a Beatle album. Think about yeah. it as the soundtrack to the Let It Be movie. For and sure. And the album will be much better if you listen to it that way. Whereas you don't, like, compare it in your head to, like, Abbey Road. Right. But, fuck, there's some stinkers on that album. There really are. There really are. And it's... Uh, it has my least favorite Beatles song. What's that? Long Unwinding Road. Oh, okay, that's right. You yeah. said that before. Right, I, right, right. I hate the Phil Spector version. I hate the Let It Be Naked version even more. I, I just don't like the song. The, o the huh. only version I kind of like is there's some version from the from the Get Back sessions where Billy Preston was like on the organ and there were some drums in there. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm like, sure. I'm like, okay, that actually sounds kind of decent. No, I love The Long and Winding Road. Oh, man. Uh, well, we, we can still be friends. Hooray! Yeah. And last question. Why, why do you think the Beatles still matter? The Beatles still matter because it's just genuine, good music. And when something's that damn good, it's going to be enjoyed for decades to come. It's just plain and simple. Like, I hate when people try to overanalyze it. And, oh, it's good because of this and this and this. No. It's just good music with a great message. And, I mean, come on. It's been 60 years <laughs> since, you know, the Beatles got together. And we're still talking about them. And younger generations are into them. And they're still breaking records. And no other musical group to come, or even in the past will ever do the same ever i i actually for once don't have anything to add it's you you hit the nail on the head Thank I, you. I agree 100 percent. it's just good and unless there's any other you know memories that come to mind you know off the spur of the moment um i want to pass it over to you it's usually my second favorite part of the show. What do you want to plug? <laughs> what do I want to plug? I'm very, I'm very forward. You know, I, I appreciate yeah. it. No, um, definitely. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel out there. I know, like, unfortunately, my Back to the Future podcast, What the Flux, has taken up a lot of my time as of late, and I honestly haven't been doing much record collecting as I should. But McCartney 3 is coming out soon, and I'm definitely going to be talking about that uh, as soon as it's available to listen to. How many to. copies did you pre-order? Just the Spotify copy, that's it. I'm not like those crazy people Hello? who, you know, buy up everything and just, uh, you know, sell it all or whatever. Well, yeah. I, I've only pre-ordered one myself. Which one did you get? Well, again, I, I was lucky enough to see the announcement just as it came out. Oh, uh, did you get the yellow? I did not get the yellow, 
because okay. Third Man Records fucked that up and announced that like an hour early. And so it was all sold out. However, the red one, I I was able to get the link before it sold out. And I, I nice. sent it to my mom saying Christmas present, question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, and I'm like, I'm not telling you to order it, but if you don't order it within the next hour, it will sell out. <laughs> so I, I can only assume I will have it. Yeah, I got the uh, Spotify exclusive for that one, and that's it. And I did the same thing with Egypt Station. I just got the one, and that was it. Well, I, I got the link to the Spotify one, but I'm like, Ethan, no. I, I wanted to get the, the Spotify Egypt Station, but I wasn't yeah. sent the link to that one. Uh. So I, I, plus, Egypt Station sucks balls. I'll say that. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, there's some good tracks on it. See, my beef with Egypt Station, and this could probably go on to for a whole other episode, is that there were so many bonus tracks and all that shit. Don't even fucking get that, me started. That, that are better, that are better songs than the ones that are actually on the album. So why wouldn't McCartney just choose the best of the best, put that on Egypt Station, release it, and have it go to number one for a real reason instead of it going to number one <laughs> just because he put out 10 million different variations. Fucking preach. Fucking. Yes. But, you know, the most upsetting part was, like, the following year for Record Store Day, he put out that uh, In a Hurry Home Tonight single, and yep. they're both killer songs. They're great songs, and, like, and they why should have been on the why album. Why couldn't Egypt Station have been that? Yep. Nope. I've been. I said that. You, I probably have a rant about it on a YouTube video somewhere. Yeah. No, but yes, I would like to plug my yeah. YouTube channel. You just go to YouTube.com and type in my name, Caitlin Larkin. That's C-A-I-T-L-I-N-L-A-R-K-I-N. Uh, you can also find me on the TikTok. Uh, I do the On This Day in Beatles TikToks. Th those pop you know, up you in my have... TikTok feed. Hell yes, yeah. Yes, I admit I have a TikTok. TikTok? I, I, I don't make videos. I just I just watch. Yeah, so if you like to see me do On This Day in Beatles History, uh, my TikTok is just Caitlin Larkin089. Uh, let's see what else. I also do social media for Joe Johnson's Beatle Brunch. So if you want to listen to Beatle Brunch on Sundays, go to brunchradio.com. If it's not on a radio station near you, you can always listen and become a Beatle Brunch Club member. And I think that's it. <laughs> oh, now I get to try and say my sh my plug spiel, which I'm I'm still getting used to saying. Whew, let's let's see if I can do this. You got All right. this. If you're if you're listening to this episode on YouTube, if you haven't already, please hit that red subscribe button. Please hit that bell notification icon so you get notified every time a new episode is uploaded. And I occasionally upload other things, so you'll be uh, pleasantly su surprised. Uh, please like the video if you liked it, or if even if you didn't, just hit the like button. It's polite. Uh, tell me what you think in the comments, or if you have any other uh, feedback, uh, you can reach me at fansontherunpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, we're on Facebook, uh, Fans on the Run Podcast, Instagram, Fans on the Run Podcast, and uh, we're available to stream just about everywhere you can think of. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbay, iHeartRadio. I'm going to pass out if I keep saying all these. And there's probably like a billion and a half more streaming services that Podbean signed me up for that I don't know about yet. <sighs> Pro tip for you. What you got to do is just record your outro and have it say all that stuff in it. So you just tag it on at the end of the episode and bam, you don't have to lose your breath. Do you think I'm that professional? <laughs> I mean, if you want to be. Eh, yeah, that's that's life. Anyways. Caitlin, it's it's been a it's been a fucking blast talking with you today. Yeah, Ethan, it's been awesome. Thank you so so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. To everyone else out there, thank you for listening. You can go home now. Fans on the Run is produced by Ethan Alexander. Additional voiceovers by Richard Phillip. This has been a Showtime production.